All right. Hey, welcome everybody. Hope you got uh, a chance to go grab your, your coffee real quick. But um, I'm John Palmer and this is Exploring Spatial Software. So this should be pretty fun. I'm glad you chose it as your first talk. Um, I'm going to do two things here. I'm going to quickly set up a definition of spatial software, or at least what I mean when I use that term. And then we'll spend the rest of the talk doing kind of like half show and tell, half building a light design framework for building spatial apps. So let's just uh, get started. This is an interface. And when we look at an interface, usually the elements are statically positioned on the screen. So sure, we can occasionally like drag and drop something and scroll up and down the screen. But usually, there's kind of a rigid logic for how elements are positioned. And that's pretty different from the world that we live in, right? So like, if we think about the world, it has elements in it too. But we can make a pretty meaningful distinction between bodies and objects where bodies are alive and they move about and do things of their own volition, where objects are not alive, they're non-beings, and they just have forces enacted upon them. And the other thing that makes a world feel really different than an interface is that it's defined by free movement within space. So bodies and objects don't just have like static positions, they move around. Spatial software has a world in its interface. So if we kind of combine those conceptual diagrams together, we get this. There's an interface and inside it, there's a, a rich virtual world, okay? And um, this is a conceptual diagram, but if you wanna see what this looks like in practice, typically it's something more like this. So here we still have bodies and objects, right? But in this case, the bodies are the paddles, they're being controlled by players and the object is the ball in a game of Pong. And the movement within space here makes it feel really, really different than a lot of software that we use day to day. Like this is so different than something like a, a note taking app or a messaging app that we're used to. And it's so different in fact, that usually when we look at stuff like this, we just consider this to be associated with gaming. But spatial software is not just about gaming. When we design software around analogies of space, we get all these amazing qualities, right? So we're spatial beings and we live in a world. So when we use strong spatial analogies in software, it becomes more intuitive. Or when we see bodies or avatars inside of an app, we get a strong affordance of presence of other users there with us. And because there's free movement and there's more degrees of freedom within spatial software, that software becomes more expressive as well. And this stuff is obviously useful outside of just gaming, right? So let's take a look at an example. This is an app called Gather and Gather is used for virtual conferences and working in a virtual office. And the way this works is you can walk up towards other people and when you're standing close by, you get connected with video and audio chat. So for conferences, this is amazing, right? Like you can bump into someone in the hallway between talks and strike up a conversation or start talking to the person sitting next to you at a keynote. But let's take a look at how this works in the virtual office setting. So um, I'll take a, I'll go to a GIF here of what it looks like to use Gather. And you can see, you can do stuff you would do with other virtual office software. So like there's a traditional chat interface on the left-hand side and I can have a video call with someone by walking near them but I can also do all kinds of things I could never do with other office software. Like for example, there's a sense of nearness or farness. So I can go work near my friend Steve in the kitchen, even though we're not talking at all. But it's not just about that feel, it's also really functional. If I have a question here of something like, who's everyone in my company meeting with right now? Instead of going to Google Calendar and like clicking through a bunch of different events and seeing whose names are on which invites, I can just take a walk around the office and see who's standing in the same room. And I can like immediately and intuitively get a sense of an answer to this question. Now, Gather's not the only app taking advantage of spatial software. Many spatial apps are already getting popular today. So there's a whole range of like design tools, virtual meetup software, social apps and video calls that are all taking advantage of movement within space. And I think that spatial software is the next big UX paradigm. So the same way that chat UIs kind of started out as this niche online behavior, and now are like ubiquitous across all the tools that we use today. I think the same thing is about to happen for gaming. So yeah, games have been around for a long time and like adults play games too. But right now we're seeing unprecedented amounts of gaming amongst kids and teenagers. So you might've heard like the crazy statistic that 50% of kids in the US between the ages of nine and 12 have a Roblox account. And all three of these games on the left-hand side have hundreds of millions of monthly active players. So just think about these people growing up now and just like project that 10 years into the future. We're gonna have millions of kids get entering the workforce at that point who've grown up on gaming controls, who are really familiar with this type of interface. On top of that, 
the tools for building spatial apps are getting better. So we've got amazing game engines, design tools, and web frameworks for building interactive games. So as designers, this is like an amazing time to start paying attention to this type of app because when you design something this way, it's pretty different than designing a lot of software that we're used to. And I'm gonna jump into some design considerations next, but before we do that, I just wanna answer like one caveat here. Aren't all apps spatial? And I would, I would say, yes, they are. Like if we're designing apps to be on screens and in 2D, like there's gonna be some dimensionality to that. Like everything is spatially laid out on the screen, but that's not really what we're talking about here for the purposes of the talk. So, so last year I made this diagram. This is kind of half a joke, half serious. And you don't need to look at all the examples on here right now, but this is the spatial software alignment chart. And I think it kind of shows that there's different degrees of spatiality. For the purposes of this talk, I just want to rule out a couple things here. So along the bottom row, we have stuff like Discord and Clubhouse where we might call that like a space for talking with friends or a space for hanging out, but it doesn't literally have space and like you can't move about freely in these apps. So that's not what we're talking about. And then on the right hand side, we've got like the user anarchist column. And as designers, like we don't really want to design stuff that users end up hacking for unintended purposes, or at least that wouldn't be helpful in a design talk. So let's rule that out too. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. Um, the top left quadrant of this diagram, this is spatial software. All these apps, they actually have virtual worlds within their interface that allow for free movement of bodies and objects. So there we go. So let's jump into design considerations. Now the first one here, this might be a little bit counterintuitive um, and that's invoke spatiality only when helpful. So I know I just described all these amazing qualities of spatial software, but it can have some trade-offs too. Like, it can take more energy to like um, move about or navigate within space, or it could be more tiring for a user to have to put in like continuous input to move around. So let's look at some examples of when spatiality is helpful or not helpful. And I think a really good first example since we're at config is Figma, right? So if we look at Figma's interface, it's pretty easy to divide this between the virtual world and then the traditional interfaces. And this is a pretty helpful breakdown. Figma's doing a good job of like using spatiality where it's actually helpful. When I'm designing software in the middle here, it's really helpful to me to be able to like drag my frames around or organize them spatially and even see like other cursors in the window that are working. But when I go to the layers panel on the left or the inspector on the right, I'm glad that they're just using like more rigid logic, right? Like it's helpful that layers are just organized by Z index or when I go to use a color picker on the right hand side, it's just in the same place every time. Now, this is obviously helpful because we can imagine an alternate reality where Figma was designed to be more like PowerPoint or Google Slides. And this is pretty obviously worse, right? Like we can feel it. If I had to like add an, every, a new design and put it into this linear list on the left every time I, I added something, it would be forcing the structure that, that I don't want. I can no longer move about freely in the world. But spatiality isn't just magically better for everything. So if you look at another example, like an email app here, uh, in email apps, things are typically sorted in like reverse chron chronological order. And that's pretty helpful for the task of doing email, just like reading my emails and replying. I could try to get really cool with it and like say, here's my new spatial email app. And this looks kind of interesting, but like it's not immediately better. Uh, it's not immediately obvious that this is like better or, or good for doing email. So there's no hard and fast rules for when to use spatiality, but here's some suggestions I have. First, when imposing other logic would add unnecessary overhead. So if we look at like the, the Figma example, forcing designs into like a linear list isn't helping designers think. Um, another would be like when complex human dynamics are being recreated. So think of like the gather office uh, or, or having a conference when you wanna quickly like reorganize into different groups or, or move around spatially. Third is when removing spatiality would destroy affordances from any kind of like real world scenario that you're trying to recreate with software. And fourth, this is more of a gut feel thing, but um, when movement makes things fun. So now I can move on to more, more design considerations when, when we're using space. And the next point I wanna make is that designing your space is designing your product. So when we start designing a spatial app, we can make kind of like high level decisions, like what's the level of fidelity I wanna have in my space? You know, like do I wanna have like a lo-fi 2D canvas over on the left or Maybe I want like a rich immersive world like Minecraft on the right, but we're not just choosing an aesthetic when we design spatial software. There's all kinds of fields to learn from that are solely dedicated to designing great spaces to be in. So we can learn from things like game level design, 
landscape architecture, urban planning, and interior design. A game level designer might say something like, you need to build a sense of rhythm into a space so that a player is kind of going through some dramatic procession of like ebbs and flows in a plot. Or a famous lesson from urban planning would be like, when you design a city, you don't want to design long empty blocks with blank walls because these aren't spaces people will want to spend time in. And we can learn from mistakes. So like a famous bad example of urban planning is Boston City Hall Plaza, right? Where it's just this big open concrete space. And turns out um, these aren't spaces people really enjoy spending time in. But we can also learn from good examples and just kind of go about in the world and learn from how we use spaces. So here's just photos from, from my iPhone camera roll. And we can see a couple examples here, like on the left-hand side, a New York City subway station. There's you know this yellow line along the ground telling you where not to stand when the train approaches, or there's clear signage overhead telling you where to walk if you need to find customer assistance or an exit. Or even just look at like a street in New York as well. We've got separate areas for like pedestrians to walk. We've got a bike lane for bike riders. We've got another area for cars. And without these affordances in the space, it would be utter chaos to try to like organize everything. So. Let's move to an example of, of virtual offices. So this is a use case that's really popular for like spatial design right now. And um, if we think about it from a product designer's perspective, when we're making an app like this, we're not just designing an app that happens to have a virtual office in it. We're actually designing a virtual office. So as product designers in this case, it might make a lot of sense to like learn from interior design and start thinking about what makes a good space. So many of us have probably spent time in the real world in offices that we consider really great or maybe offices that we didn't like at all. And we should start thinking about those things, like what makes a good office good? Is it maybe like it's really well furnished or it's easy to navigate or maybe it has just the right rooms for everything that you wanna do. So, so looking again at gather in the top right here, you know, there's a kitchen area and maybe that tells me that's where I would do kitchen related things like eating my lunch or just catching up with a coworker. And then up top, there's a conference room, and maybe that's where I'd meet, meet with my team. Or if I'm really busy and I just, just need to go heads down working by myself, I can go to a desk area. So here, I, th I think it can get really tempting as, as product designers to like decide to, do, like, to decide to build a spatial office app and then move on to like designing the features. But we can really spend an unlimited amount of time just designing the space. That, more than anything else, is going to really define how people experience the product. And even though real world affordances make a lot of sense for offices, it goes a lot deeper because since we're using software, we can build things that we can never build in the real world. Like we can have gravity lifts or like portals into other spaces or unrealistic physics that just feel really cool. And so it's important to have a really multidisciplinary approach when we're designing spaces and software. So the takeaway here is just to learn from a bunch of other fields and incorporate them into our product design skills. Now, the next design consideration is not so obvious. You know, the spatial software term can be a bit misleading. Like space is in the name, so we know we're going to be designing spaces. But equally important is designing bodies. So my third point here is that bodies and spaces are an inseparable pair. And I want to set this up with a quote from this book, The Ecological Approach to Visual Perception. This is written by James Gibson. And a fun fact for designers in the audience is he actually coined the term affordances way before it made its way into software design. In the first chapter of his book, he says, the fact is worth remembering because it is often neglected that the words animal and environment make an inseparable pair. Each term implies the other. No animal could exist without an environment surrounding it. Equally, although not so obvious, an environment implies an animal to be surrounded. So this is really key. We see like environments and animals have this like dualistic relationship where each one has strong implications for the other. And if we're designing spatial apps, we consider these kind of like our two primitives. We've got bodies and we've got spaces, and we could just as well relabel those animals and environments. So it's helpful to kind of go back to the beginning and here's our diagram of the world. But if we look at this, this is kind of like the bird's eye view of a world. You know, we're looking down and we can see the world itself and the many bodies and objects. But let's take a look from a more human perspective, right? Like when I'm in the world, I only have one body. And from the perspective of my body, Everything else is my environment, including other bodies, objects, and the space around me. So if we wanted to relabel this diagram, animal and environment, we might relabel it like this. And this is a really nice like core ontology to start from as, as a designer, designing spatial software. We've got our body and we've got our space, and we need to design those two things together to have a good fit. So let's make this point tangible again. Here's some, here's some famous um, spaces inside of video games. So hopefully, you know, maybe you've played one of these games like Super Mario Bros, 
Animal Crossing New Horizons, Mario Kart Double Dash, and Fortnite. Now, if we try to like think back to being in these spaces, we have visceral memories there, but it's impossible to think about being in these spaces without also being in these virtual bodies. So you could say something like, you know, the, this, the virtual body is an organ through which I perceive the virtual space. And like bottom left here is, is Mario Kart Double Dash. I know every turn of this racetrack and I can remember every part of it. But when I think about being there, I think about being a Nintendo character in the cart from the game. The space wouldn't feel the same at all if I was like walking around on my own two feet or even driving a different car from a different game, like a Ferrari from Gran Turismo. You can make that even more clear looking at something like Super Mario 3D World, right? So here I'm playing as Mario and if I go eat the giant mushroom, all of a sudden my character is like 20 times bigger. So this obviously changes how the body feels, but it also changes how the space feels. Like now the space feels kind of cramped. And if I didn't show you that slide right before this one, maybe you just look at this game and say, oh, this is a Mario game where like the levels are really small. So these two things are obviously affecting how we perceive each other. And as product designers, we've traditionally had a pretty limited conception of what it's like to represent users' bodies inside of software, right? Like we've got a few standard options like the static JPEG profile picture, the video rectangle from something like Zoom, or occasionally there's something kind of creative like the anonymous an animals inside of a Google Doc. But it would be naive to think that we can just like take these user representations and port them into virtual spaces and expect them to act like bodies. Bodies are kinesthetic, they move around. Like we need more dynamic representations of users. And so again, here's a chance to learn from game design, um, specifically character design. The character designer within a game will try to design the perfect body to inhabit a virtual world or to play a specific game. And if we're talking about this being useful in all different kinds of verticals of software, as product designers, we need to do the same. We need to design the right body for the right space. So let's go ahead and take a look at some body space pairs from products that we know. And again, these, these will be good examples, so it's not all bad. So let's start again with Figma. In Figma, the space and body pair that we have here is the infinite gray canvas and the cursor. So after all this talk about space design, you might say like, well, isn't like an infinite gray canvas kind of underdesigned? And I'd say it's definitely underdesigned, but this is actually a great space design for a design tool, right? Like we are designers using Figma. And I'm glad that this is kind of an unopinionated space that I can do whatever I want with. The same is actually true for the cursor, right? So a cursor in Figma is kind of like the minimum viable body representation. And it tells me just enough. A cursor is enough to know who's in the file, where are they, what are they working on? And again, because there's movement, because it's a virtual world, you can actually gesture. So a cursor is just enough to kind of like wheel your mouse over here or, or circle something and catch someone's attention. Now, if we go back to gather, it's a really different example. Again, we've got a very opinionated space, unlike Figma's gray canvas, and that's actually helpful for facilitating real world social interactions. The body design here, though, makes sense as well. So my body's more limited. You know, I have to walk from point A to point B. I can't just kind of teleport and furniture can get in my way. I can collide with things. But again, this makes a lot of sense for facilitating real world social interactions. If I walk over to you in the kitchen in the real office, I don't just like appear next to you and start talking. My approach towards you is part of the interaction. And um, Gather's thinking about this. They've chosen like a good body for their space. In fact, like compared to almost every other virtual office tool, I think Gather is really the one thinking the most about body design. So if I'm in an office and I want to really feel myself in that space, um, it makes sense that I want to see myself represented on the screen. And so Gather has this cool avatar picker where I can pick between a variety of different skin tones, clothing options, and hairstyles. So that I really see myself there. So think about how weird this would be in different use cases, right? Like imagine the Figma canvas with the gather avatar. Like again, this looks funny, but it's obviously not the right choice for a design app. Like if I had to go walk all the way across my Figma canvas to see some other design and then walk all the way back when I'm just trying to get a reference, uh, that wouldn't be great for the task at hand. And like, I also don't want my coworkers to come like stand on top of what I'm working on. But it gets even weirder. Imagine like here's the gather office with the Figma cursor as my body. And at this point, this doesn't even feel like I'm in the office anymore. This is like, I'm in the God mode, like hovering above the office, or maybe I even feel like I'm kind of like designing the office. Like I've got this cursor. At this point, like I don't have a body representation here that makes sense for the space. And it kind of just starts to look like I'm just looking at an image of an office. So I hope this makes the point clear that when we design spatial apps, we design our spaces, but we design the bodies in tandem and those two things have to fit together. 
So one more design con uh, consideration here, and that is that game feel defines user experience. So in tech, like we talk about feel a little bit, like occasionally you hear someone say like a oh, superhuman feels really fast or linear app like feels really snappy. And th those things are great, but it's often like an afterthought or just like a nice to have thing when, when we talk about it in tech. But once we get into game design and therefore spatial software design, feel becomes really, really important. So there's this book, Game Field, that talks about this. Um, feels the most overlooked aspect of game creation, a powerful, gripping, tactile sensation that exists somewhere in the space between player and game. It is a kind of virtual sensation, a blending of the visual, aural, and tactile. In short, it is one of the most powerful properties of human computer interaction. Now, let's make that more tangible, right? We can remember what it feels like to, to play different games. So, in Super Mario 64, doing the triple jump with Mario, we, we hear him kind of shout out and do a flip on the third jump. Um, it feels kind of like bouncy and energetic versus something like Rocket League is in this low gravity environment. It feels kind of like floaty and a little sluggish, or maybe you even played like Temple Run on your iPhone and it felt like really fast and, and frantic. If you haven't played any of those games, maybe you've at least played Guitar Hero. And we can remember the feeling of like hitting the chord in Guitar Hero and getting like all of this visual and audio feedback that we're like hitting that chord and playing that song, even though all we're doing is like pressing plastic buttons on a controller. In game design, there's actually a term for this of, of, of juicing, which is this practice of just injecting a game with tons of feel. People call this like maximizing the output of a player's inputs. And there's this really great talk called Juice It or Lose It, where two game designers kind of take a really basic game and then one by one add just layers and layers of feel as they gradually turn everything up to 11 out of 10. And you can kind of take the same game and the same mechanics and end up with something that feels really, really different. So if you want to look at an example of that from the real world, we can look at Tetris, right? So here's the original Tetris game. Um, the mechanics are there, like you can move a block, you can rotate it, and you can like move it down to the bottom of the board. But if we want to see the same game injected with tons of feel, we can look at the Tetris effect from 2018. So in this version of the game, every single thing that a player does has a ton of feedback on the screen. You know, you've got blocks are glowing, the entire environment's glowing, the camera's shaking when you have certain actions, and we can't hear the sound here, but actually music is a big part of this game. Every single thing the player does plays a different note in the same key. And so you're kind of like creating a song as you play the game. So here, this is a really good example of like, it's the same game, but it feels totally different. The cool thing as designers here is like we can get really into the nitty gritty of different details without really wasting our time. So you can take any detail in game design and uh, even something as specific as like the theory and practice of cameras and side scrollers has decades of innovation around how do we move the camera in response to the player's body. And even these subtle changes to the game can really change how it feels. The point I wanna make here for designers is things that we usually consider polish when in spatial software become part of the core product. So things like animation, sound design, physics, lighting, and cinematic effects all have a huge output in terms of how, how a product feels. So maybe as a designer, you're used to like, um, oh, when we do the button hover state here, let's, let's add a drop shadow and let's add like a, a two pixel animation and we're just polishing up our app. But in games and spatial software, this gets way more extreme. So a really extreme example here from, from the book Game Feel is Street Fighter 2 without animation, just weird fighting boxes, right? Like all Street Fighter really is, is boxes that are changing shape and colliding. But it's the animation and the sounds and the camera work and the character design that make it feel like Street Fighter. So here are spatial software design considerations. Just to repeat through them, we've got invoke spatiality only when helpful. Designing your space is designing your product. Bodies and spaces are an inseparable pair. And game feel defines user experience. But this alone isn't enough to design a great spatial product. We can't expect, expect to like slap spatiality on top of a use case and just iterate our way to something great. A good product needs a purpose and an inspiration and a soul. And so there's, we're missing something here. We need to add one more thing to our design framework. And that is start by spending time in games. Even though spatial UX may be new to us as product designers, there's decades and decades of rich history in game design where people have built expertise in crafting amazing experiences for players. And it turns out the best way to come up with like spatial software ideas isn't to think of like X but spatial, but rather just spend time in games getting inspired and then use our own creativity and intuition 
to figure out other use cases for that. So who knows, maybe we start playing games and we play Lonely Mountains Downhill and we think like, wow, I hear the birds chirping and I have this really peaceful nature feel. Maybe this would be a great place to like have a meditation experience or maybe some kind of therapy app where I can walk through the woods. Or I play Townscaper and even though I'm just creating like these cute little towns for fun, I realize this is super intuitive and maybe there's a tool for like urban planners or game level designers here to like quickly prototype different concepts. I could play Stardew Valley and get a sense of like the vibe in this space and say like, man, I'd rather like hang out in a digital garden with my friends instead of a Discord server every night. Or maybe you take it the other way and it's about education and you can use this app to like teach people about gardening and then someone can go do the same things in their backyard. Or you end up in Kind Words, which is like the game version of lo-fi beats to study and relax to. And um, you realize, oh, this is a really cozy space. Like I'd love to do some journaling here. Maybe there's even like a remote co-working tool where I share music with friends. We can make games for everything, but if we want to live in a world where more products feel like amazing games, feel really intuitive, we have to spend time in games ourselves as product designers, getting inspired and learning from the history of game design. So I hope that teaches you something and gets you excited about designing a whole new kind of app. Thanks so much. And um, special thanks to David Cole, Tiago Sada, the whole gang at Other Internet, and Jordan Montgomery. And if you want to talk more or, or see more about me, here's where you can find me online. Thanks so much.